let's welcome Pastor Alex. Well, good morning. Happy summer. Amen. We're going to continue. Um, we're kind of in a series. I, <laughs> they give me a hard time because I'm not much of a series kind of guy. But we've been, I was challenged by Don Potter when he asked if you guys have been taught on the tabernacle. And I decided that, you know, I probably ought to, we have talked about it, but I never talked about it in consecutive weeks and really began to teach on the tabernacle. And the reason for that is sometimes this is a complicated kind of a high educational kind of thought process that usually takes a book. And so it's, it's sometimes difficult to, to get the, the, the things across in a practical way in 35 minutes. That's not a prophecy. That's just a, a hope. And so um, we've been going over that uh, over the last weeks, and I'm going to have to kind of review today to, to bring us all up to speed. So I hope I'm not too redundant, and I hope that you get a really clear picture as we walk through the tabernacle that God made. Now, the thing that I want you to remember about the tabernacle is that it was, you know, it was thousands of years. It was the picture given to Moses in Exodus. And it was thousands of years before Jesus was walking the planet. And, and what God was doing was showing his people the promised Messiah. And he, and, he, and he has this place of worship constructed that would plant that hope inside every believer, every person who would call on the name of the Lord, who would call on Yahweh. And so he has Moses, and he designs this tabernacle. And one of the things I love in Exodus, it talks about, he says, listen, man, I got these dudes. And how many of you guys work with your hands, you blue-collar guys that work with your hands every day? There's more of you than that, because I know you do. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of a cool thing, because this is what the Lord says. He says, listen, I'm, I've got these guys picked out, and I'm going to fill them with the Holy Spirit, and they're going to be able not only to see the vision and the wisdom that I'm giving them, wisdom being this vision from God, I'm going to give them the ability to do what the vision says. Now, what does that sound like to you? Doesn't that sound like grace? That's grace. Empowering them to do something that is beyond them. I'm going to fill them with the Holy Spirit, and they're going to do this thing. And so he has these uh, articles of furniture designed in the tabernacle, and it's really made up of three different rooms. There's kind of a foyer area. And I'm, what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to make this where it is applicable to you, where it's not just some brainiac that has to understand it. What I want to do, I, I'm going to dumb it down to Alex's level so that we can actually begin to apply this stuff in everyday life and understand what God intended it to be for the church. It's not just some Bible scholars, uh, what he does as a hobby. It was given so that we could understand the things of God. And so it's really three rooms. You have a foyer kind of a room, and you come into that foyer kind of place, and the first thing you see is an altar that is made for sacrificing. And two times a day, every day, there are sacrifices on that altar in the morning and in the evening. There's something very important about the morning and the evening sacrifices. And, and, and what the, one of the things the Lord's been saying to me lately, and you could take this for what you want to take it for, if he designed that he would be worshipped in the morning and in the evening, I think it might be a good idea if we added maybe, you know, we say, you know, seek him first thing in the morning. Maybe God wants to be sought in the morning and in the evening. Would you think that might be a picture of that? That, we, that there's a morning sacrifice and there's an evening sacrifice. And, it, and, and it's with, you know, unblemished animals that are sacrificed on that altar. And it was for the atonement of sin, for, so to sacrifice for sin. It was to, um, 
to, to put away any destruction that sin caused, it was to put it away. He, he has healed my past. Everything, if you've made Jesus your Savior, do you realize that everything in your past has been erased? It says about you that he remembers it no more. And so this sacrifice that was made as soon as you came into the foyer of the tabernacle was so that the, the, the effect of sin on your life would be atoned for, that it would not have any place. First thing you do is you make the sacrifice for sin when you come into the temple. The second thing you do before you enter the, the holy place there's three rooms. The first room is kind of the foyer. The second one is, is a, a, a more holy place than the first. But before you enter in, there's a laver. And that it is a, it's a bowl, and it's not much probably bigger than the podium. And it's full of water. And the priests, is what they would do is they would wash their hands ceremonially, wash their hands before they entered the next room, which is the holy place, and that washing of hands was to symbolize purity. It also symbolizes baptism. Once you've received the sacrifice, that you would go to the next station, which is baptism, which is identifying with the sacrifice before you go into the next place. And the next place is called the holy place. Now we've talked about, if you haven't, heard these messages we've talked about each one of them on Wednesday night or Sunday night this next Wednesday night we're going to talk about the Holy of Holies which is the the last room but you receive the sacrifice and then you're baptized and then you you go through the ceremonial washing that says I identify with the sacrifice and that allows you to go into the holy place and when you go into the holy place, there's three articles of furniture on the left side. Now, it's not an aisle that was any wider than the aisle that we see here. And there's a candlestick on the left with seven candles. It's the light of the world. It represents the presence of God. It represents Jesus or God's ability to cast out darkness. He's the light of the world, takes away the sin of the world. It's the presence of God also represents the presence of God. So you go from this place of sacrifice. This is so important. You go from this place of sacrifice. You ceremonially identify with the sacrifice, and then you're able to move into the presence of God. On the left is the presence of the candlestick, the light of the world that casts out darkness, shines light on anything not kingdom. But you're walking in, and what does it? It's the presence of God. I love what we were just talking about and what Stephen just said. On the right side of the room, is, is where the unleavened bread is kept. There's 12 loaves of unleavened bread, and it's the, it's the, it's the altar of showbread. It's the table of showbread. And that showbread means it could also be called the, the, the table of presence, and it represents the presence of God. It represents the idea that the priest needed to live six days a week on the food of God. The manna that comes from heaven, the body of Christ, it represents the communion that Jesus would establish with his disciples. It represents those things, and, but it, it mostly represents the presence of, of, of God and the fact that you need sustenance from the word more than you need it from just physical sustenance. Because what they would do on the seventh day, the priests would actually eat the bread. So one day a week they would eat the bread. Six days a week they would eat the bread of life, which is what Jesus described himself as in the New Testament. Do you see how this is pointing to Jesus? Again, it's the presence of God. That's why we as a church put so much emphasis on the presence of the Lord. So many ch churches and, and, and maybe uh, ways of thinking stop at the labor there's a sacrifice there's a baptism and that's pretty much it but the sacrifice and the baptism its whole design is so that you can go into the presence and you can walk into the presence of the Lord 
And so, and so you have the candles, and then you have the lampstand, and then you have the table of showbread representing the presence of God. It's just amazing to me how many times Jesus referred to him as the light of the world. In Colossians chapter 1, he says that G through Jesus, if you've received the sacrifice, if you've been baptized, if you've washed your hands and purified and identified yourself, made a public profession of faith that Jesus is Christ, you have the ability to move into the presence of God, and he is the bread of life. Man does not live by bread alone, but every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And there needs to be this emphasis in your life that, know, that you know that you need the sustenance of the Word of God more than you need sustenance for your physical body. And that's why I think there was a sacrifice in the morning and a sacrifice in the evening. You start your day with the Lord and you end your day in thanksgiving recognizing the fact Everything depends on him. So your next article, right before you moved into the Holy of Holies, the Holy of Holies represented where, where not, not Jesus, but the Father was. And you couldn't go in there. The only person that could go in there only went in there once a year. And when he went in there, what he did was he took blood from the altar and he sprinkled it on the horns. And there's, you know, different, different things. But basically, he sprinkled the blood of the offering on the Holy of Holies and on the mercy seat once a year. And he had bells, <laughs> he had bells on his robe when he went in there and they tied a rope to his leg in case he died because nobody else could go in there. There was only one that was allowed to go in there, right? You track it with me? And so there was atonement made for the people of God once a year. The priest did it, but before he made atonement for the people of God, he made atonement for himself first so that he wouldn't die. And then he makes atonement for the sins of the world. But right before that is the altar of incense. This is so beautiful. And it represents the prayers of the saints. And it sits right in front of the entryway to the Holy of Holies. And it's the most precious thing to God. The most precious part of the holy place is the altar of incense. And the reason it is is because it represents you. It represents your petitioning. And it sits in the entryway to the Holy of Holies. It also represents Jesus sitting at the right hand of the Father, forever interceding on our behalf. It's the altar of incense that represents the prayers of the saints and the intercession of God. Romans chapter 8 says, when you don't know what to pray, the Spirit prays for you, intercedes on your behalf. And it's this sweet-smelling aroma to God. Look at what David said in Psalm 127. Psalm 127. I think it's Psalm 127. It's actually close to 127. It's Psalm 141. Psalm 127 is really worth reading. hmm <laughs> But Psalm 141 is the one we're going to read today. David says this, Let my prayer be set before you as an incense. The lifting up my hands as the evening sacrifice. We make a sacrifice of praise. Offer your bodies as a living, holy and pleasing to God as your spiritual act of worship. And it comes before him as a sweet-smelling aroma. Now listen to this. This is so cool. In the morning, the priests would come and they'd make sacrifice for every friendly at the altar. They'd make the morning sacrifice. And there would be a great crowd there and they'd be interceding and there'd be a sacrifice made and they would take that 
blood and that and those coals off of that sacrifice and they take it to the table of incense and then they would put the coals with the incense from the altar you know how you heat your little stuff at home it would heat that incense and it would begin to bring this aroma up and and from what tradition says you could smell it for like blocks now if you were thinking about cooking a lamb you probably could smell that for blocks but they say uh, through tradition that the overwhelming aroma was the incense and so they, the priest comes in in the morning and, and they change out the incense in the morning when they make the sacrifice. They, they, they say, it's, a, it's such a great picture of the priest making atonement for sin and bringing that place thing to a place where we're now bringing it to the table of incense, to the altar of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. Because of that sacrifice that's been made, this prayer of a saint has the ability to rise up before God. And it's with the morning sacrifice and with the evening sacrifice they change this out. That's when they do it. Now listen to this. Turn with me to Luke chapter 1. I'm just showing you stuff. Am I, am I losing anybody or am I tr are you tracking with me? Verse 8. 1 8. So it was while Zechariah, and this is the story of Zechariah and Elizabeth, who are the parents of John the Baptist. So it was while he was serving as priest before God in the order of his division, according to the custom of the priest, his lot fell to burn incense when he went into the temple of the Lord. And so this is Zachariah's time. What he's doing is he is assigned the responsibility of taking the coals from the altar, bringing them to the table of incense, establishing the coals underneath a fresh, a fresh product of incense that he's going to put on that altar, and it's going to go up before the Lord. And that's what he's doing. And he's in the midst of that, and he comes to the altar of incense. And there appeared before him an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense, which is the prayers of the saints. And Zechariah has been praying. When we saw him, he was troubled and fell down before him. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zacharias." your prayers have been heard and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son and you shall call his name John and you will have joy and gladness and many will rejoice in his birth for he will be great in the sight of the Lord and shall drink neither wine and then he gives this proclamation and when that happened he will also be filled in the Holy Spirit by the Holy Spirit in his mother's womb so in this moment of work, he's coming to this table of incense, and the Lord has heard his prayer, just like he hears your prayer. That is not a coincidence that that's written in the book of Luke for you and me. What have you been praying for? What's barren in your life that God needs to bring alive? What is it that he needs to do? This is not here by accident. It's here to show us that God hears the prayers of the saints. And so there's this table of incense which represents the prayers of the saints that is most holy to God. It is standing in the doorway of the presence of God. And when we think about Jesus, 
we have to think about Jesus being the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And so Jesus comes into the world and it puts himself in the foyer on the altar of the tabernacle. And he sacrifices himself for the sins of the world once and for all. So that we could identify with him in baptism. So that we can come into the holy place in the presence of God where light is shined on darkness where you are no longer a slave to sin but you've been given victory and power over sin where the presence of the Lord there is freedom you've been set free who the Lord has set free is free indeed you can see all this stuff coming alive in the presence of the Lord with the showbread that we need to eat upon him that we need to know him and to spend time with him that that needs to be the most precious relationship that you have is with your Lord it's forever and so we come to this place this table of incense and that aroma goes before the Lord and it blesses God and when he died on that cross and when we identify with him and then we come into his presence it says that the that day that the holy of holies the the, there's a curtain that stood between the Holy of Holies that nobody could go in but that priest, and that was only once a year. And on that day that Jesus laid himself down, this picture in the tabernacle showing us of what Jesus did, it rent the, the curtain in the Holy of Holies from top to bottom, from God to man. It rent it wide open so that from that day forward, you and I would be able to come into the presence of Father and, and our prayers would be heard by him. And he says this about you. Ask according to his will and it will be done. It moves us into a whole other place with the Father. That's you and me. That's you and me. It's a picture of Jesus. The thing about it is, it was so brilliant. What Brock brought, and then what Stephen brought. Your testimony is, is all about my Lord died on that table so that I could identify with him, so that I could come into his presence, so that I could be one with God. Turn with me to John chapter 17. Our worship and our prayers, your prayers, your prayers are the most important thing to God. If there's any awakening of our minds brought, it needs to be the place that God so loves you that he wants to hear you and he wants to answer you and he wants to prosper you and not to harm you, that he's out for your good and he's not some ogre looking to punish you. He wants you to understand his love and his desperate desire to hear your cry. Before we get to this, <laughs> let me just take you to Revelation real quick. Revelation chapter 5 is a picture of heaven of what just goes on right here. When Jesus died in, uh, in Hebrews chapter 3 and Hebrews chapter 8, it talks about that, that this tabernacle is made with men, but there's a tabernacle in heaven that, that this is a duplicate of. And that Jesus Christ, when he died on that cross and he was sacrificed on that table in that foyer, that, and when he went through, he, he rose to heaven and he went to the Holy of Holies and he sprinkled his blood on the altar once and for all in heaven before God so that your sins will never be remembered ever again. Ever, ever, ever. <clears throat> and I hadn't got enough time. In Revelation chapter 5 it says this. That there was a scroll and no one was able to open the scroll. Who is worthy? 
It says, to open the scroll and loose its seals. And no one was found, neither on heaven or in earth, on earth, to open the scroll and loose its seals. Except Jesus enters the picture. And it looks like the Lamb of God that was freshly slain for the sins of the world. He is worthy to open the scrolls and the loosened seals. And listen. And it says the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb of God who is worthy to open the scrolls and loosened seals and held up the bowl of incense which is the prayers of the saints. Because God loves you. And it's the most valuable thing to Him is to hear from you. What's the first thing we see in Revelation? Your prayers. The Lamb was slain. He's worthy. Hear the prayers of the saints. He loves you. Giving you access to the Father. You have access to Yahweh, the creator of the universe. And you can come boldly to his throne. And he is desperately in love with you, anxious to hear your petition. Jesus prayed for the disciples, and I'm going to read the whole thing, and I'm going to read it fast, and then I'm going to close. Jesus is about to be crucified. He's about to go through this whole process, and he prays for his disciples, and then he prays for you and me. And I want you to hear what he prays about. You need to really take note of what he prays about. It's so important because it's simple. Somewhat of a long prayer, but it's simple. He lifted up his eyes to heaven and he said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son that your Son also may glorify you. As you have given him authority over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as you have given to him. And this is eternal life that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, the Messiah, whom you sent. I have glorified you on the earth. I have finished the work which you have given me to do. And now, Father, now, Father, oh, my Father, glorify me together with yourself with the glory when, which I had with you before the world was. I have manifested your name to the men whom you have given me out of the world. They were yours. You gave them to me, and they have kept your word. They have kept your word. Now they have known that all things which you have given me are from you. For I have given to them the words which you have given to me. You remember Jesus said he doesn't say anything or doesn't do anything unless he's heard the Father say it or do it. And he's saying, listen, they've received everything that you've given to me to give to them. And they received it and have known surely that I came forth from you and that they have believed that you sent me. You think it's important to believe that Jesus was sent by God and that he's Messiah? And how he knows you believe is that you keep his word. I pray for them. I do not pray for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. And all mine are yours, and yours mine, and I am glorified in them. Now I'm no longer in the world, but these are in the world, and I come to you. Holy Father, keep through your name those whom you have given me that they may be be one as we are one. Keep those. If you've got your Bible, I would underline this particular passage. Keep through your name those whom you have given me that they may be one 
as we are one. You're going to find that that is Jesus' prayer. That the church of Jesus Christ be one as the Son and the Father are one. That the church of Jesus would be unified front, be a unified force in Christ. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in your name, those whom you gave me. Where am I? Am I at the right place? No. Yes. Yeah, okay. I have kept, and none of them I lost except the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled, Judas. But now I come to you, and these things I speak in the world, that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. What is Jesus' prayer for them? That the joy that the joy that Jesus had would be in them and they'd be fulfilled. So he's looking for oneness in the church and the joy of the Lord. I've given them your word and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I do not pray that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them by your truth. And your word is truth. Separate them out to your word. You remember the table of showbread. That you can't live by bread alone, but every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. It's important as a congregation of believers, if we want to see the, the presence of God, the glory of God, we've got to become people of the word like we've never been. No matter how much you love the word, we've got to become people of the word that make a Sacrifice in the morning and in the evening, if necessary, to get the Word of God in us. As you sent me into the world, I also have sent them into the world. As the Father sends Jesus to do His work, to do kingdom work, so Jesus sends you to do kingdom work. If you ever want to know what the will of God is for your life, there it is. There it is. However it comes out. I don't think he cares that much about how you make a living. He is the one who makes provision for you no matter what you do. But he wants you to be kingdom carriers. And so he's prayed so far for joy oneness and a receptivity to the vision of Jesus, to the commissioning of Jesus. And for their sakes, I sanctify myself that they also may be sanctified by the truth. I've, I've kept the truth and I'm going to experience what my call was so that they can experience what their call is, so that they can be successful in their call as well talking about the disciples mostly oneness joy and commission but I don't only pray for those disciples alone that were there with Jesus but I also praise for those who who I will believe who will believe in me through their word that they all may be one as you father are in me and I in you that they also may be one in us that the world may believe that you sent me. So here's the prayer from, from, from the Lord to God the Father, from, the, from God Jesus to God the Father. As Jesus is praying that he be glorified like he was before the world was created, his prayer for you is this, that you be one with the Father. That access has been made at the altar, so that you can be one with him, so that you can understand who he is and understand kingdom. Brock, that's exactly the word from the Lord, that we're not this or that, we're not American, we're not Russian, we're not whatever our background is, culture changes, 
And we're all from different cultures, and sometimes it's really whacked out. We are the kingdom culture. I saw a text the other day about a woman who said that we don't have to be weird. It's a preacher that we don't have to be weird to be full of the Holy Spirit. To me, that says that we don't have to we don't have to look much different than the world to be full of the Holy Spirit. And I just totally disagree. We have to be kingdom carriers, and that doesn't look like the world. It looks different than the world. We need to be kingdom carriers. Let me finish. I don't pray for these alone, but I pray for those who will believe in me from their word, that they may be one as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world would believe that you sent me. So if you want to be effective with your family members, You're not going to argue them into the kingdom. You're going to show them kingdom. You're going to become kingdom. You're going to do kingdom. You're going to be different than them. I and them and you and me that they may be made perfect in one. And that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. Do you hear what Jesus is saying? He hasn't got off one topic. And that topic is that you be in oneness with God. The topic is that you have a relationship with God the Father as Jesus has relationship with God the Father. He hasn't gotten off that topic. How do you do that? Unity and oneness. How do you do that? You've got to recognize that it's the presence. You've got to recognize that it's the Word of God that you've got to eat more than you eat food. I'm saying that a lot because I'm understanding in America we're addicted to physical food. And we have to change the way we think. We've got to get our bodies in alignment so that our spirits can prosper. And so he says, I and them and you and me, and they may be made perfect in one, that the world may know that you sent me and, 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 and have loved them as you have loved me. Do you know and do you believe? I know, it's, I know it sounds religious. I, re I really know that it's, it sounds really spiritual. But Jesus says about you that the Father loves you as much as he loves the son he loves you as much as he loved Jesus and this whole thing this tabernacle would be a picture that Jesus would fulfill in scripture that he would come as Messiah so that you could know this one thing that God loves you as much as he does his son. God loves you so much that he gave his only begotten son so that who should ever believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Father, I desire that they also whom you gave me may be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory which you have given me, for you have loved me before the foundation the world oh righteous father the world has not known you but I have known you these have known that you sent me and I have declared to them your name and will declare it that the love with which you love me may be in them and I in them the tabernacle the prayer of incense coming before God. Now do you know why it's a sweet smelling aroma? Because he loves you as much as he loves Jesus. He wants to hear from you as much as he wants to hear from his own son. He wants to be one with you like he is with Jesus. And Jesus living in you through the power of the Holy Spirit. It's good for you, Jesus said, that I go away. Because if I don't go away, I can't send the Holy Spirit. 
and you are the temple, you are the tabernacle of the Spirit of God. Now do you understand why you shouldn't sin? Why you need to rebuke sin? Why you need to push away from the world and its system and belief and be a kingdom carrier? Well, there's only one way to do it, and that's pursue Jesus with all your heart. So here's the call. Michael, go ahead. Here's a call. Some of you might need to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior, the sacrifice that he paid. I don't know. You know whether you've made him Lord of your life or not. You know whether your sins are forgiven. Nobody else does, just you and him. Or maybe you haven't washed. Maybe you need to be baptized. You haven't been baptized since you believed. Maybe you were a baby and you got baptized in church somehow. Some denominations, some traditions do that. They baptize babies and they're as if they were baptized in the church, and that's not the case. The case is once you've received the sacrifice in the tabernacle, you came and you, and you washed your hands. Maybe you need to be baptized. If you want to be baptized, just tell them at the information center. They'll take your information, your, 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 uh, your email and your name and your phone number, and they'll get that. And we'll get you baptized. We'll, we'll do that shortly. We've already got some that are lined up to do that. Some of you just may realize today how much God loves you. And I pray that you begin to understand more and more how important it is to be in the presence of God. And I pray that you would desire the presence of Jesus like never before. And I pray that you would desire his word like never before. I'm telling you, the more you read it, the better it is. And the, and the, and the more you realize you're not doing it. <laughs> it's not like you can, the closer you get to Jesus, you know, the better you feel. The closer you get to Jesus, the more you realize you're missing it most of the time. That's usually the way it is. But some of you just need to change your way of thinking. And understand that God loves you as much as he loves his own son, Jesus. And there's nothing greater than your prayers to him. They're a sweet-smelling aroma. Listen, again, when they sacrificed on that altar of incense, it overtook the smell. They said you could smell it all the way through camp. Not the burning flesh, the altar of incense, the prayers of the saints. Just think for a moment. It is a duplicate of the tabernacle in heaven. It's not the blood of Jesus that overwhelms heaven. Although it's, it allows you to come. It's the prayers of the saints. That's not sacrilegious. There's no way into that without the blood of Jesus. But it's the prayers of the saints that hit the nostrils of God because the first thing that offered after Jesus shows himself as the Lamb of God in worship by the prayers of the saints that's big who are you in Christ you're not anything Stephen without Jesus it's just Jesus and the cross and him crucified. That is your testimony. But you're a son of God. You're a daughter of God. He's dying to hang out with you. He died to hang out with you. He wants to talk with you. He wants to answer you. If you're desperate, you've got to do what he asks you to do. You've got to move in what he's already given you, right? He's going to talk to you. He's going to give you wisdom. He's going to move you forward. How many need to grow in that? The love that you realize that God has for you. I just want to make sure you heard me correctly. There's nothing more valuable than the blood of Jesus. But what smells up heaven is the worship of the saints 
Amen. Let's stand. I'm just going to pray and ask the minister to come. Okay. I want to ask you a question. What are you going to change? What are you going to change? What are you going to change? How are you going to, how are you going to kick it up? You know, what, what, what needs, what are you going to give up so that you can pursue the Lord? Because our schedules are so stinking busy that we need God, right? We, we, we need the Lord, but they're so busy that we don't often can get there in the morning and the evening. How many would say that would be a challenge with your schedule? Getting with the Lord morning and evening. Is, am I the only one that that's a challenge for? <laughs> and we'll get with the Lord morning and evening. That's going to be a challenge. So the thing is, you've got to make, you've got to make a change as far as your pursuit of God in the Word and in prayer and in intercession. So I want to ask you right now, what is it that needs to change? Man, I can, every time I get here, I feel so much resistance. It's unbelievable in the spirit. We are so stubborn as people. But there's no way. I'm talking about me. I'm not just talking about y'all. There's no way to get what God wants to give you unless you make him one. Make him number one. And that opens up heaven. So, Father, I just pray for vision. I pray, Lord Jesus, that TV wouldn't be more valuable or a television show more valuable than your presence and your word. I pray that the things that the world draws us to, I pray that our Facebook page wouldn't be more valuable than your word. I pray that our video games wouldn't be more valuable than your word and your presence. I pray that our hobbies wouldn't be more valuable than your presence or your word. I pray that we would recognize, God, that you have so much for us and you desire to hear from us to such a degree, God, that your love wants to be poured out toward us. Jesus, I just thank you for your sacrifice once and for all that made me a son of God and a daughter of God. I pray I understand what that means today. I follow you in baptism and I pursue your presence in your word more than I do life itself. That I'm more affected by kingdom than I am by the United States of America. And my culture. That I would be a peculiar person because I'm a kingdom person. jealous he is jealous he is jealous for me loves like a hurricane I am a tree bending beneath the weight of his wind and mercy All of a sudden, I am unaware of these afflictions eclipsed by glory, and I realize just how beautiful you are and how great your affections are for me. And oh, how he loves us so.
Lay hands on somebody beside you. Let's pray this prayer and then we'll be dismissed. Father, in the name of Jesus, say it with me. Father, in the name of Jesus, pour out your love. May my friend be receptive. May my family member be receptive. May they be one with Jesus. May they be one with the Father. May they have thinking like God, like Jesus. Thank you. Bless them, I pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. If you need prayer, our ministry team will be up front to pray with you. God bless you. Y'all have a great week. We'll see you Wednesday night.